Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. Glad you're here. I have a thought for you, and that is, what would it be like if God had given us no law whatsoever? None whatsoever. Here's some of my thoughts. First of all, I go to the passage in Romans chapter 4 and verse 15, which says, where there is no law, there is no violation. And so, without law, there is no wickedness. It can't be called wickedness because there's nothing to compare it to. But there's also no righteousness because there's nothing to compare it to. No one can say, I've done good, I've done well, I've done right. Because there is no good, there is no well, there is no right, there is no law from God. And there is no justice, because there's no wickedness, and there's no injustice. In fact, it even gets worse. There's no such thing as mercy, there's no such thing as grace because there is nothing against which these things can work and be compared to. In fact, it's kind of like the fact that there is no moral difference between a piece of coal and a diamond. One is not more moral than the other. One is not more righteous than the other. One is not more holy than the other. But one is not more wicked than the other. One is not more evil than the other. They just are. And without God's law, we're just like a bunch of rocks. <laughs> nothing matters. Nothing good, nothing bad, because there is no source of information outside of ourselves that identifies what is right and what is wrong. In fact, without God's law, there's no need for a Savior. There's no need for us being here this morning. There's no need for us to praise God in song. There's no need to beseech His blessing in prayer. There's no need to encourage one another to good deeds and to love. Nothing really matters without God. And this is one of the frustrations that atheists have. And that frustration is purpose. What purpose do I have? And it boils down to, I have to decide what I think my purpose is and pursue it because that's all there is. That's all there is. And yet, there is God's law from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, God gives them actually two aspects of law. You may not have thought about there being two aspects of law, but there is. Listen. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, here's the first one, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely. That's a law. This is what you can do. This is what is allowable when it comes to the trees in the garden and the fruit that it produces. But then he gave a negative aspect when he said, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. So there is the negative aspect of law. Going into Tulsa, the speed limit is 65. That law says from the positive aspect, you want to drive 55 miles an hour? Great, you're legal. You want to drive 58 miles an hour? Great, you're legal. You want to drive 64 miles an hour? That's fine, you're legal. You want to drive 65 miles an hour? You're legal. You want to drive 66? You're not legal. That's the negative and that's the positive aspect of the will of God. And both of them have consequences. Doing the things that God approves, the consequences bring blessing. Many times the blessings are physical. Sometimes they're emotional. Sometimes they're social. And especially sometimes they're spiritual. But there are also consequences of disobeying God's laws. In this particular passage, it says, For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. The title for this lesson is actually called The Promise. It's not called The Law. It's called The Promise. 
Because one of the first things that Adam and Eve needed to hear, is there any hope? Is there any hope whatsoever? And as God talks to Satan, here is what Adam and Eve hear. I will put enmity, hatred, between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and he shall bruise, you shall bruise him on the heel. And so at the death of Christ, even though it seemed like Satan was winning, and those who wanted Jesus crucified were winning, they didn't realize that the very act they were doing was the act that would allow for the payment of sin. But they were doing what they thought needed to be done. And the promise that Satan would be defeated was made in the very beginning. I want you to notice the phrase, her seed, because the promise is based upon the birth of children. I want to take you to the next time that this particular thing is mentioned strongly in the Old Testament, and that's to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Lord God said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. There's that promise again. There's going to be a blessing made available for everybody upon the earth. He also said, in addition to these two things, in verse 7, Take to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And so there you have it. These three promises given in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 and verse 7. There's going to be a blessing through Abraham available to all people. And it would be through the seed mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. There would be a nation for the purpose of bringing this blessing. We need to remember the purpose of Israel. The purpose of Israel was not to have a nation by the name of Israel. The purpose of Israel was to have a people through whom this blessing would come. That's the purpose of Israel. But... If you have a nation, you've got to have a place to put them. And so God said to Abraham, the land that you're in, the land of Canaan at that time, the land that you're in is the land that I'm going to give to this nation where they can develop and grow and in effect become the nation through whom this promised blessing is going to come. But there's one thing that I haven't mentioned yet. If you have a nation and you have a land, and you have a purpose, you need a law for that nation. And so this is where the Old Testament came in. I want to help a little bit in understanding right at this point. The law of Moses was given some 400 years after the promise was made to Abraham. And we're going to get into the book of Galatians. It's going to talk about the fact that the law, which came later, did not in any way affect the promise. In fact, the law was designed to help the promise be fulfilled. And the book of Galatians and the book of Hebrews talks about this. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 15 through 19. And I've only given you a few things here, but I want to read this entire passage to you. It's important. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it's only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Simple illustration, 
if I go to your house and say I want to buy that used refrigerator that you've got sitting out in the patio, and you say, Bill, I'll sell it to you for $100, and I say, deal, I'll come back and get it in a week, we've got a deal. But just suppose that you change your mind and you say, when I get back next week, Bill, I've decided I want $200 for that refrigerator. I'd say, no, can't do that. You agreed on 100 that's what I agreed to. That's our covenant. That's our agreed price. But just suppose that he also had a washer sitting out in the patio. And so when I come back to buy the refrigerator for $100, I say, I think I want that washer too. That has no bearing upon our deal with the refrigerator. I hope I'm making sense because that's exactly the illustration that Paul is using. Even though it's only a man's covenant, yet when it is ratified, no one sets it aside or adds condition to it. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seeds. He does not say into seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, the Old Testament covenant, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. What was the promise? All nations are going to be blessed through your seed. What was the law? What purpose did the law have? And Paul gives us the answer. Verse 18, if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. The keeping of the old law was not the promise. The promise was the seed of Christ. But the law was given for a purpose, and that purpose was to guide the nation of Israel living in the land of Canaan the way to behave to prepare for the coming of Christ. That's the purpose of the old covenant. But Paul says it better than I do. Verse 19, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. In other words, Israel needs to know what's right and what's wrong. They needed to understand the difference between good and evil. So, to Abraham, God says, I'm going to make your descendants a great nation. He says to Abraham, I'm going to give them a land to live in. He says to Abraham, I'm going to give them a law so they can know what is right and what is wrong. And I'm going to ask a question and let Paul answer it. How long was this law to last? I'm going to begin at the beginning of verse 19 and read the whole verse this time. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained by angels through the agency of a mediator, Moses, until until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. That's how long the Old Testament covenant was to last. It was to last until the coming of Christ. The law does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God, the promise. Why the law? It was added so Israel could know right from wrong so that they could be the nation to bring the Christ into the world. And their job was to get the world ready for Jesus. And it didn't happen that way. Not only did it not happen that way, but they insisted that Jesus die, the leaders did. And they fought Christianity tooth and nail 
for years. Paul being an example of that. Persecuting Christians, taking them to their death. They fought it, they fought it. But their job was to bring Christ into the world. To fulfill the promise that God had made to Abraham. And that law was to last until Christ came. Let's continue on in the book of Galatians. This time in chapter 3, verses 24 through 29. We're still talking about the law, its purpose, and its job, and how long it was supposed to last. Because if the Old Testament law could save a soul from sin, Jesus would not be needed. If animal blood could take away my sins... I would not need the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore the law, according to Galatians 3 and verse 24, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Uh, I don't like to do this very much, but I do need to every once in a while. The Greek word here is pedagoge, which I'm sure means little of nothing to you. But the pedagogue in a wealthy home was the one servant who was trusted so much that he or she was to take the child from the house to the master teacher. Do you know who does that today? Bus drivers. The Old Testament was the bus and the driver to take the children of Israel to the master teacher, Jesus Christ. I know what I did when I got to school on the bus. I got out and went in to be taught. That's how long the Old Testament was to last. That's how long the nation of Israel was to be that special nation. That's how long they were to have claim to that land according to God until the promise came. They had a job to do, and it was to say, world, here's the Messiah, here's the Christ, here's the promise fulfilled. That was their job. Verse 25, but now that faith, Christ, has come, we're no longer under a tutor. Kids, get off the bus. That's... That's a very blunt and plain and oversimplified way of saying it. Get off the bus. Jesus is here. The master teacher has arrived. And so the pedagogue, the tutor, the schoolmaster, as he is called in the King James Version, his job was done. I realize once the day was over, it was his job to make sure the child got safely back home. But the point that is being made in the book of Galatians is the Old Testament was the trusted guide, the trusted servant of God to bring Israel to the bringing in of Jesus Christ, the promise. And the Old Testament law was to pay, take people to the promise and its job then was done. Well, listen to this. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Not in the law of Moses. Not in Moses. Not in the prophets of old. But you're saved by faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourselves with Christ, not Moses. The blood of Christ, not animal blood. To become a priesthood, not a Levitical priesthood. So that you could pray straight to God through your high priest, Jesus Christ. But in the Old Testament, if you sinned, you took your animal to the priest. He offered it on your behalf. But today we have a high priest in heaven, Jesus Christ. And this is why we say at the end of our prayers, or perhaps at the beginning, or even somewhere in the middle, we pray through Jesus Christ. Christ to the Father because we as Christians are priests under the new covenant. 
What a wonderful thing that is. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. Did you know that? Because a Christian is in Christ, the promised seed given first to Adam and Eve as they heard what God said to Satan, given to Abraham that through his seed all the nations would be blessed. That seed, Jesus Christ, came and fulfilled the function of the Old Testament law because that's what he says. I want you to listen to some verses that talk about this. Your sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You have been baptized into Christ. You've been clothed with Christ. And because you belong to Christ, you're Abraham's descendants. Do you ever stop and think that you're a descendant of Abraham? There's a phrase. Abraham is called the father of the... Do you know the answer to that? Raise your hand if you don't. Don't need to speak out loud. Do you know the, the next word? Abraham is the father of the faithful. That's the promise. That's the promise. We are children of the promise in Christ. And so, when the church started, that's what they started proclaiming. Acts chapter 13, verses 23 and 24. From the descendants of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus after John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Oh, incidentally, did you catch that? It's not, a, it's not a part of my notes. But John's baptism was only for the Israelites. It wasn't for everybody. It was just for the Israelites. Side note. Next passage, Acts chapter 13 and verses 32 and 33. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. That God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that He has raised up Jesus as it is also written in the second Psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And then we go to another passage, Romans chapter 9 and verse 8. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. The book of Hebrews is an amazing book. But in getting ready for that, I want to tell you a couple of things that Jesus said about the Old Testament and His role in fulfilling it. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law. And did you know a lot of people stop right there and they say, well, that's why we go back to the Old Testament for, for our tithing. That's why we go back to the Old Testament for burning incense. That's why we go back to the Old Testament for burning candles. But Jesus didn't stop there. He said, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. I came to fulfill their purpose. It's been an arrow pointing from Adam and Eve down through Abraham, down through Israel, down to Bethlehem, down to the birth of Jesus Christ, the promise fulfilled. And that's what Jesus said. I didn't come to make the Old Testament law of no value. I come to fulfill its purpose. That's why I'm here. He says, in essence, the same thing in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And that's exactly what Paul had said in the book of Galatians. The Old Testament is our schoolmaster, our tutor, our pedagogue, if I may. Our special servant to bring us to Christ. And once we're at Christ, 
the function of the Old Testament law as a guide in matters of spirituality is no longer our guide. No more animal sacrifices. No more going to the temple. No more the tabernacle. No more the bringing of the doves as an offering. No more the separate priesthood. It ended because Christ fulfilled its purpose. Let's go to the book of Hebrews just for a few moments. I want you to notice how the first two verses in Hebrews talks about the distinction between the Old and the New Testament. And I read those verses. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets and in many portions and in many ways, He just described the Old Testament. In these last days has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. There it is. There's the Old Testament, and there's the New Testament. Chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10 in the book of Hebrews helps us to better understand the fulfillment of Jesus and the promise and the function and the temporary nature of the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12 says, For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. Jesus could not be a priest under the Old Testament law. He could not even go into the temple because he was of the tribe of Judah and not the tribe of Levi. Consider chapter 7 verses 18 and 19. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former co commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. What could the Old Testament not do? It could tell you you're a sinner. But what could it not do? It could not forgive sin because it's based upon animal blood. That's why we needed a perfect sacrifice in Jesus Christ. The law made nothing perfect, verse 19. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. That's the promise. That's the promise. Chapter 7, verse 22. It says, So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The promise. Consider chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then there would have been no occasion sought for a second. That's why we don't go back to the Old Testament for practices in Christianity. Sanctified by the blood of animals. New Testament sanctified by the blood of Christ. That's why we don't have a separate priesthood. That's why I don't wear special clothing that distinguishes me as clergy from the laity. That's, that kind of thinking comes straight out of the Old Testament. Clergy, laity. Clergy the call, laity the people. That's Old Testament thinking. That's why I don't preach tithing. I preach giving as you purposed in your heart because that's in the New Testament. And last Sunday you learned that's why we don't sing with instruments of music in worship because that's not a part of a new covenant and wasn't for centuries. And they taught it was wrong. They correctly understood the new covenant. They knew they should sing without it. And so should we. Yet, just this week, I mentioned this to a young man. And he said, well, all I want to do is just make a joyful noise to the Lord. It really didn't matter that the early church didn't use instruments of music. He just came at it from a different direction. You know, when we start coming at the Bible from different directions other than what the Bible says, we get ourselves into trouble in a hurry. 
Look at another passage. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. I read it again. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. That's the old covenant. Why? Because it was based on animal blood and its function was to temporarily guide the nation of Israel to the point of the birth of Jesus Christ and His giving His covenant and establishing it and ratifying it when He died on the cross. Which brings us to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The animal sacrifice couldn't cleanse the conscience. It could go through the ritual outward cleansing and temporarily take those sins, in essence, to the foot of the cross. But only when Christ died were those sins actually forgiven. Why? Because that's the promise. The very promise God made when Adam and Eve heard the curse given to Satan, when God spoke the promise to Abraham and repeated in numerous places in the Old Testament. Remember, the job of the Old Testament is to say, Jesus is coming, the Messiah is coming, He's coming, get ready, prepare, get ready. That was the function of the Old Testament. But I want you to listen specifically to this passage concerning when the Old Testament no longer was binding and when the new covenant of Christ went into effect. For this reason, He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, did you hear that? When Jesus died, the benefit of His blood went back to those who were faithful servants of the Lord in time, to Adam and Eve. All sins that were forgiven before Christ died were forgiven based upon the cross. That's what this verse has told us. Those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. When did the covenant of Jesus go into effect? A covenant is the same as a testament or a will. If I make a will, when will my will go into effect? When I die. When I die. The Old Testament, what died to put the Old Testament into effect? Animals did. It's animal-based blood. It's animal-based covenant. What went into effect when Jesus died? His covenant. And the Old Testament was no longer the guide. Plus, the fact that it never was given to the Gentiles and to Christians in the first place. It was just for the Jews. He continues, For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it never is in force while the one who made it lives. Oh, which law did Jesus live and die under? Well, there's your answer. His covenant did not go into effect until he died. He lived and died a Jew under the law that God gave for the Jewish people to bring him into the world so that his covenant would be established. Hebrews chapter 10. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The new covenant. 
Does the Old Covenant have a purpose? Yes, it does. That's another sermon. But I'll give you a passage that does refer to it. It says, it is for our learning. Not for our guiding, but for our learning. You know about God? Old Testament's a good place to learn about how God feels about obedience and disobedience. How God is merciful and faithful and just. How God is loving and kind and compassionate. You can learn a lot about it, but you don't learn to animal sacrifice. You learn to sacrifice yourself. And that's what God wants. He doesn't want your lamb. He wants you. He doesn't want my lamb or my calf or my doves. He wants me. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. And it is through His blood, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Do you know what the holy place is today? It is the church, the spiritual body of Christ. Not this building, but it is the spiritual body of Christ. This is not the sanctuary, the temple of God. This people are the temple of God, according to his inspiration in the book of Corinthians. The promise is first preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches a sermon, and at the end of the sermon, they ask the question, what shall we do? But remember, the title of this sermon is The Promise, and I want you to notice the part that the promise plays in this, in this answer to the question, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Incidentally, both of those are imperatives. Those are commands. For the forgiveness of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, there it is. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Just as many as want to answer his call, that's who the promise is for. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. What does this have to do with me? Everything. What does this have to do with you? Everything. Jesus put it very simply when he said, Seek first the kingdom of God, that's the church, and his righteousness, that's holy living. And all these things will be added to you. He knows we need food, he knows we need shelter. <coughs> He knows medicine is a good thing. Even Jesus is called the great physician, acknowledging that there are physicians who take care of our body while he is the great physician to take care of our soul. He knows these things. But of first importance in my life needs to be the body of Christ, the church, and holy living for my God. Because... That's where the blessing of the promise comes into life. That's where I really live. Not just exist, but live. And because of God, I'm not a rock. I'm not a nothing. I do matter. I do have purpose because of the promise. Two invitations. First of all, those of you in the video audience and those here in the audience in the auditorium, prize that promise. Hold on to it with all your might because it was in God's mind before the beginning of time. And before the beginning of time, Jesus committed to empty himself. 
and fulfill the promise. But the second appeal is to those of you who are here. Are you right with God? Have you been buried with Christ in baptism to be raised to walk in newness of life? Have you committed a sin that is publicly known and this congregation needs to know that you've repented? It's not that we're interested in digging into your, into your soul. It's we want to be able to say to people in our community, if Bill has committed a sin, Bill came to us and he told us about it. And we know, and we know Bill's trying. He's not just trying to be a hypocrite. But are, are there prayer needs? Is there something going on in your world that you would like for our church to pray for, to pray about? Good things, bad things, hard things, whatever those needs are. We're here to help you get to heaven. Let's stand and sing.